Okay, Martha, I have to tell you this story, okay? It goes back to 1982. I was at the nuclear uh, uh, arms march in New York City, 1982, and I hooked up with two people. It was huge. There were, I think, three million people there. It was the most incredible march I have ever seen. All the streets were lined up, and they had uh, red caps or uh, white caps, uh, young people who were directing people. Maine and New England was parked in one avenue and so forth and so on. It was absolutely incredible. And um, the uh, Central Park was mobbed. You couldn't walk through it. it was, there were so many people there. Uh, but I hooked up with um, uh, two people, um, Fran Truitt and Bob Bontius, both retired ministers who had m recently moved to Maine. I'd, I'd never met them before. And we started to march uh, together. And then two other women joined us who had just come from Japan. They, had, they were survivors of the nuclear uh, U.S. nuclear bomb attack. So uh, to follow on from that, uh, many of us in Maine were concerned about what's going on in Central America, the U.S. policies there. So we organized a group throughout Maine. And in 1985, we had a caravan, a refugee caravan that came through. And here is the photo of it. These were refugees from Central America. They were illegal refugees. They were coming up to talk to people about what was going on in Central America. Now, I lived not far from the main state capital, and I spent a lot of time there lobbying, and I got to know Joe Brennan very well. In fact, I could call him Joe, and his secretary was a good friend of mine. She was a Franco-American from Lewiston. So, I asked Joe Brennan at the time if he would be willing to meet with this um, caravan, this group of people from Central America. And he said, well, I'll give you 10 minutes. So we went up to the office with all these wonderful people, 16 uh, people from Central America. Well, he gave us over an hour. He was so intrigued by what these people had to say. Uh, I can read to you some of the uh, there was a young boy who rode in the car with me. He was from El Salvador. Omar, the bitterness is marked on his young old features as we drive his story pours out, moved to tears by his account of a lifetime of unrelenting violence. I am tempted to pull over to the side of the road and embrace him and weep. Ephraim comes from the country. His family was very poor, no electricity, gazing off, gazing off into the distance of his mind, avoiding our eyes, the pain etched on his features. He tells of his father and uncle being dragged from the house. After being tortured, his father's arms are chopped off. Then he's killed. His uncle, in his agony, pleads for death. These are some of the people that were on this caravan that spoke to Joe Brennan at the time. So. And Lucretia, who was from Guatemala, the only woman on the caravan, stayed at our home for that night or a couple of nights. She was from a devout Catholic family, was a teacher. She explained to her students what was going on in her country. She became a danger. She was a risk that she had a risk of going back to her country. She would be killed. So Joe Brennan listened, and after we met with him, he said, bring me all the information you can. I want to know more. So after he left the governorship, he went down to Central America with a religious group. I'm not sure which group, whether it was the Episcopal group, but he did go down to see what was going on. And he ran for Congress, and he became our congressman. He served one term and then decided to leave, which was very dismaying for us because he was our voice on Central America. So there was a meeting at the Senator Hotel in Augusta, yeah. held by the Redem Democratic State Committee. And I went, and I spoke up. I was not a member, but I, being prone to speaking up, I blurted out that I was really dismayed that Joe Brennan was not going to be going back to Washington because he was the only voice that we had against the policy, U.S. policies in Central America. 
two days later, I get a phone call from George Mitchell's office saying he'd like to meet with me. Now, I had met with George Mitchell earlier. I had gone to Washington, well, no, I'll, I had uh, gone to Washington to lobby with a group called Network. That's a social, it's a group of nuns who've formed a lobbying group. They're a social, they run around the country in this buses, of the nuns on the bus, if you've ever heard of them. And I spent a week at Georgetown University at a seminar, and we went every day to lobby on Capitol Hill. And uh, so I uh, had uh, bid on a main peace campaign a lunch with George Mitchell in the Senate dining room. So I did have lunch with George Mitchell and uh, I talked about nuclear. And I found out then that he was a real Paul, that he avoided any uh, commitment to any issue, whether it was nuclear arms or uh, uh, Central America and so forth. So anyhow, I went to Nicaragua. I went down to Nicaragua with a Fran Truitt, the woman I had met in New York City, organized a woman's delegation for Witness for Peace to go to Nicaragua. So I decided I'd never been abroad in my life before. I was 56 years old, but I had seen pictures on TV, horrible scenes of uh, troops attacking young people in the steps of the cathedral in El Salvador. So I decided I would go, and it was the most incredible experience of my life, going down to, this was during the wartime, 1987. And I have an article here that I wrote. It was, you know, we wrote, we lived like the people did. We, we slept, uh, you know, on, um, you know, on boards out in the yard with the pigs and chickens, and uh, we drove on the back of a Toyota pickup truck that uh, had to be, um, wired in the back so that the you know the back tailgate didn't come down and uh, at one point we were driving there were third, uh, 16 women we separated there were 33 women in all but we broke up in two groups we, we started in Managua where I'd never seen such poverty and uh, in the house that we stayed in uh, across from a little mar army unit which was really Amazing. Here we were, a nation of over 300 million people fighting a country of 3 million people, mostly children, because the families said you know, there were more children than, than grown ups. And across the street was this little army base, and these little women would walk by with guns on their shoulders and house dresses, <laughs> training for battle. And when we went up into the compass out in the country, there were these little army bases that looked like tree houses. They were so primitive. And we were, this great nation of ours was fighting these desperately poor people, you know. And uh, so we spent a lot of time visiting, you know, uh, people in different offices. We went to one officer of uh, office in, uh, in um, Managua uh, that was the uh, what, Chamber of Commerce. And it was a right wing Chamber of Commerce. They had an air conditioner, and the woman was all coiffed and beautifully coiffed. And other places, it was just poverty, you know. And the people so sincerely working to bring education, health care, you know, sources of water to the people. One other thing that we did as American women that really shamed me, because water is so precious in those countries, that uh, we were staying in a house with a couple, this other woman and I, she was uh, my my partner was a journalist from China. She had grown up in China, but she was an English British citizen. And uh, we stayed in this little house, which was big enough to hold a table, which also served as a couple's bed. Oh. And uh, we slept outside on these uh, pads, these wooden pads with pigs and chickens, and <laughs> everything, mice and rats roaming around. But it was okay. I mean, we were safe, you know. I mean, you could hear the contra, you could hear the uh, mortar firing out in the distance at nighttime. One day, when we were staying in that little place, the woman asked us if we'd like to wash our clothes. So she took us down into the river, you know. And so we took our clothes, we just dumped them in the river. And she's on the side of the river, and she's got this little plastic cup, and she's taking the water from the river, and she's pouring it on the clothes and rubbing it on the rocks. And I thought, Oh my God, we're polluting her water. We're polluting her source of water. We're throwing our dirty clothes in the water. 
you know, and she's not doing that. She's using the water very sparingly and put, you know, that was one of the most profound lessons I learned down there. And uh, this occasion we were in the, in the, after the, uh, they had checked the roads to make sure there were no uh, landmines, which the military did every day. We're on this road and all of a sudden I'm sitting in the back and I've got a gas tank between my legs and I'm smelling this gas and I'm thinking if this is going to make me sick. <laughs> when somebody yelled, the truck's on fire. So the truck driver stopped and we all leaped off the truck as easily as we could with this rope holding up the, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the eldest woman in the group was 80 years old. She was a, a German woman. She'd survived the Holocaust and she was a bookbinder from Vermont. And she was sitting on the cab, and one of the young people who was a long-termer in Nicaragua was helping her off, and the flames were going up and down her legs. And I just ran, thinking the truck was going to blow up with that gas. <laughs> and I, when I look back, here's this young woman with her pants on fire helping this young woman, this elderly woman, off the truck. In the meantime, all the people in the, in the countryside got word. So the men uh, were able to put the fire out. They took some fronds, you know, from the trees and beat the fire out and got the truck going again. And uh, we oh kept, <laughs> that was, <laughs> so that was really an in incredible experience going there and realizing that what was going on down there was a result of U.S. policy. In Waslala, the center of counteractivity, we visited the regional hospital built by the Sandinista government. The one ambulance sat on cinder blocks, a casualty of U.S. embargo. The hospital, a victim of counterattacks, was without electricity. Its age generator broken down. Its medicine spoiled due to lack of refrigeration. The hospital was dark and dingy. Its wards airless and stifling, windows screenless, beds sheetless. The children's ward in near darkness was filled with tiny children suffering from malnutrition, bronchial pneumonia, and diarrhea. Two to three children to a bed. No medication in sight nor any respirator units to ease the chronic and debilitating coughing. In their faces a look of acceptance and resignation. The hospital was lit by two kerosene torches. Kerosene is also scarce. By their dim light, we visited the delivery room, containing a reclining chair and a bucket. No hot water, no detergents, no disinfectants, an indoor privy, the smell of urine. The hospital doctor, sitting with us in the darkened hallway, lit only by flashlights, stunned us by apologizing for the lack of electricity. This was what we saw so much of in in Nicaragua when we were there. The people were wonderful, the children beautiful. Um, in one little village, one elderly woman tried to speak to us in Spanish and telling how the Contra would slice the, head, slice the throat of her son. Ship that planned ahead? Well, in, in Nicaragua, we, you know, we were, the, the Sandinistas were in charge then, but the con Contras, we stayed in a little hut one night out in the, in the woods out on the countryside and it was all dark. I went into this this hut and there was no light at all. We sat around it to circle all these people, you know, in shadows. And they were they were shelling peas. And I wore a skirt because in Central America people dressed in skirts. So most of us wore skirts. So I just, you know, opened my skirt and somebody put some peas in my and we sat there in the dark. And the men were out fighting the Contra, and you could see the, you know, the moon was coming up. You know, Martha, it was the strangest thing, but it was the most peaceful moment I've ever experienced in my life, being with those people in these circumstances. I was living their everyday life with them, you know, and I was not afraid for some reason. I was totally at peace. The moon was coming over the mountain, and yet you had mortar firing off in the distance, you know. But these people lived with that every day. And, and I remember when we left one town, we had to leave because the Contra were getting closer to this little village. And the woman, and the poverty, the poverty was, we brought beans and rice to every family we visited. This woman wrapped up 
some beans and rice and a banana and banana leaves and, and you know, and, and not banana, yeah, leaves uh, from the banana tree. Yeah. That was how she could, you know, here she's giving of <laughs> sacrificing what little they have, you know. It was their kindness, their generosity. We stopped in West Lala just after that experience with the, with the truck and they were out of food. They were literally out of food. We brought, and they fed us what little they could find, you know. Of, we brought beans and rice to everything, and I knew they were out of food. It was <laughs> just, so just, just uh, okay. Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis and his wife, Jean, and Jean was also on the main uh, peace uh, board. We were, you know, a number of us were on the board. They don't even have a history of that. Tom Sturdivant was, I was. Uh, he, he was, was a veterinarian. And he gave me a whole packet of uh, instruments to take down to Central America, you know, to, and they, they confiscated them at the airport. Of course, I had, you know, all these uh, metal tools and so forth, looked at as weapons, <laughs> scalpels, you know, a lot of scalpels and things like that. Yes, he thought that they needed them because, I mean, when you go down there, the dogs are everywhere and they're underfed and we had the most horrible uh, incident one night. We were staying at the Sandinistas had built these little uh, uh, rest stations when the when the uh, campesinos were going down to market to take their uh, their supplies, their beans or whatever. They had these places where they could stay overnight, and they had a shower and so forth. And one night we were lying there, and all of a sudden there's this horrendous dog fight out in the street. I mean, it was blood curdling. There was ones in heat, yeah. and it just it went on for hours. It seemed it was just it was terrifying. At first, I thought it was a contra attack, you know, because of the screams and so forth. But that was so ugly, you know. And we were in this very primitive uh, building that the Sandinistas had built, and they had put showers in, and the people didn't know how to use showers, and it was <laughs> pretty pretty bad. <laughs> They did share stories uh, and wonder and let us, but they were, I remember when that little house we stayed in, that little round building with the bed and the, that was a table as well, they had a baby, a beautiful, this beautiful baby. And I had brought some books and I gave them these little books and one of them was the Hail Mary in, Fra in, in Latin, in, in Spanish, in Spanish. And I tucked them in and at nighttime, I'm sleeping out on a, what do you call those wooden pads, you know, pallets. We were sleeping on wooden pallets outside. Okay. And I heard the husband reading the book to his wife. Oh. It was it was so moving, you know, and, and very softly because those people don't speak other than soft, you know, softly, you know. And uh, I left my clothes behind so that they could have some clothes. You know, we all took things along that we could leave behind for them to wear. And when, we, when I first headed down to Florida, we were gonna meet in Florida, I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, I'm gonna be with a bunch of women. It's gonna be terrible. You know, this is gonna be. And so we met and uh, we did some briefing how to, you know, what would happen if we were attacked and so forth and all these, you know, how to con confront certain situations. And then we identified, we, introduced ourselves in this circle of 33 women and I was blown away by these incredible women. They were just so remarkable. Some were nurses, teachers and so forth and deeply concerned, you know, about what was going on and what they could do to, you know, make things better and how we come back as witness for peace, come back and talk to people about what you had seen and what our government was doing, you know. It was after that, Martha, I've I'm backtracking now that I did go to Washington for that interview and, and, and uh, did the uh, uh, lobbying on Capitol Hill. So that I went to Washington and lobbied against what was going on and had this wonderful friendship with Joe Brennan, the governor. And uh, Ben Linder was a young engineer from California and he went to Nicaragua to establish a water system and while he was working on it he was shot and killed by the Contra. And his mother and sister went on tour after his death to try to raise money for water facilities for, and they stayed at our home in Augusta at the time. Beautiful, beautiful people. And Ben Linder is long forgotten. 
but he was a real hero of the times. So I think he was in his 23 years old. Uh, in April of 89, I sent a letter to George Mitchell. This was, he had just agreed to George W. Uh, George H. Bush, the first Bush president, Bush one. Okay. Uh, to uh, to send fifty million dollars to the Contras in, in Central America. I wrote him a letter and said he had betrayed me that I had met with him in the Senate dining room and that you know, and he had now become Senate Majority Leader and that it was appalling that he would continue to support the atrocities that were going on in Central America. No, he didn't write back. He didn't write back. But I tell you, I had that uh, call from him to meet. This was in, uh, in 1989, okay, two years after. I went back, I went back to Nicaragua with um, a delegation from the National Catholic Reporter. We went to Nicaragua and spent a week there Catholic. National Catholic Reporter. It's a national newspaper. It's very progressive. Wow. Okay. And we we spent one week in, in Nicaragua, and the San, Sandinistas had been defeated by then. And we went down into Managua. There was a parade, and all these members of the right-wing government were, you know, driving by in their big limousines and so forth. And uh, we spent a week there, and one of the most poignant uh, 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 experiences that I had there was coming out of the building we were leaving to get on the bus, and there was a woman standing outside with two babies in her arms, and I was trying frantically to reach into my pocket to give her a coin or to give her some money and couldn't reach it in time to get, and they had discouraged us from doing that because they were afraid that, you know, it would cre create resentment and, and you know, and. Uh, so we boarded the bus and went on to Guatemala. And Guatemala, my experience there was the most terrifying experience of my life. This was under Rios Montt, who was a brutal dictator. And everywhere we went, we arrived in Guatemala City, and what was amazing was a group of Mayan people had built, had put up a tent in front of the federal building, in front of the Capitol building, with plastic bags, you know, like black plastic bags. They were all lined up there. And there were all kinds of military vehicles surrounding them. And the reason they were there is because they had learned that a document had been found that really guaranteed them the right to their land. But Guatemala was a terrifying country because the military were everywhere with their Kalashnikov weapons in bank buildings, in hotel buildings. We drove through wealthy neighborhoods with razor wire at the tops of the uh, walls. And uh, we visited people who didn't want their pictures taken, didn't want their names taken down because they were all victims or th threatening to be murdered by the uh, authorities, those that we were funding so well. We went up into the mountains of Caban, where there was a beautiful rainforest. That was one of the top experiences of our trip. Uh, and we saw one of the Quetzals, which is a, the native bird. It's an incredible bird. We saw one while we were there, and it's on their currency, the Quetzal. While we were up there, we visited with a lot of Catholic groups. Again, don't take our preachers, don't write down our names. We're all threatened you know, by the death squads and so forth. We met with a bishop up there who told us of getting, the, the thing is, is that Rio Smart wanted to exterminate the Mayan people. That was his role, to get rid of the Mayans so they could take over their land. And uh, so we met with these people up in the mountains and as I said, everyone, everyone was so I was terrified, and, and I was not a victim of, of the, or a threat to the government in a way. But um, when we were up there, we met with a, um, a bishop, and he had, he showed us pictures of what had happened. There was a woman in the woods, the Mayans had gone into the forest to hide, 
and one woman was pregnant and she was extremely ill. She was in serious trouble. So she, they called for help and he sent an ambulance in to get her out. And when they came out of the woods, the military was waiting for them. And the people decided they wanted to hear mass. They wanted the bishop to have mass for them. And they, wanted, they invited the soldiers to participate in the mass. This is, by the way, is the, uh, this is the Archbishop of Guatemala who met with us when we were in uh, Guatemala City. I have a picture of a group of us, but I couldn't find it. And he showed us a cloth he got in the mail, or I don't know if it was in the mail, but he, he received a package. And in it was a blooded rag, a bloody rag, which said, you're next communist. So we stayed in this little um, oh, resort up in the mountains. And we were going to take a young doctor back to Guatemala City. We were hiding him with us because he was on the death list. He was marked. And I couldn't sleep. I was so terrified. <laughs> it was such a frightening country. And we got a, a knock on the door early in the morning saying, get on the bus immediately. The military is here. So we rushed and piled onto the bus, and when we got out into the parking lot, here are all these military vehicles, and the comm commander that we'd seen in this film that the minister, the uh, bishop had shown us. And if you, ha if you know, if you've never been to Guatemala, there are ravines, the roads drop off, there are no, uh, what do you call them, uh, you know, the, along the roads to prevent you from falling over. And as we had gone up through the mountains, they were pulling up a truck from one of the ravines that had gone over. And I was so afraid the military was going to drive up and force us off the road, <laughs> you know, to get rid. I was terrified, Martha. I really was terrified. And we finally got down into uh, Guatemala City. But when we were there, we went into uh, different offices, like the uh, Office of the Mothers of the Disappeared and so forth. We'd have to run down the street, run into the building quickly, make sure nobody was watching us, you know, because the secret police was everywhere. This, I was really terrified. And Did we the met. Did doctor get back? They, we got back. We, we, the doctor, the young doctor? We got him back got to uh, oh, Guatemala City. Whatever happened to, them, to him, I will n never know. Yeah. But as I said, I have never, Guatemala is an absolutely beautiful country. Beautiful, you know, there are uh, um, volcanoes and beautiful forests and gorgeous flowers along the highways. But the terror that these people were living with and still live with. And we went into a marketplace and bought some of their beautiful fabrics, which they practically gave away. And the Mayan people, these beautiful people, would keep their heads down. They would not look up. They would not look up at us. They lived in fear, you know. This was their lifetime. Uh, this is the way they, uh, they lived, you know. So anyhow, um, that was, after that is when I got this call when I went to Augusta to this meeting, you know, about Joe Brennan because of the policies. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mixing this up. And got this call from, uh, from uh, George Mitchell. So I thought, well, I can't go and see George Mitchell by myself because so many people are concerned about what's, what's going on in Central America. So I got in touch with Jerry Genesio, with Veterans for Peace, Tom Sturdivant, uh, Tom Ewell, who was head of the Maine Council of Churches at the time. Uh, um, you know, a whole, there were 15 of us in all that gathered. So <laughs> he made it difficult for us because we were going to meet with him at, uh, on December 22nd in Portland in his office on Congress Street. So I told everybody, we'll meet at one Congress Street. There's a building there with the, and we all gathered there and one particular person came with a briefcase and, a, and so forth and I said, look, I got the call, I organized this. Everyone's going to have it. No one's going to be in charge of this. We're all going to have our peace, we'll say our peace. So we went up into his office and he, Mitchell began by lecturing us about what a great country the United States was, and we should not be ashamed of anything the United States did. This was the greatest country in the world, and blah, 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 blah. It was really, really appalling, and I was getting angry. And finally I said, 
what about, what would happen if we left Guatemala? He said, if we left Guatemala, they would eat each other up. I have never, ever, ever forgiven him or forgotten that saying. And I haunted them, him after that. We had a meeting in Bath, the town hall one day with, well, Mitchell was going to be there to speak publicly to a group of people. So we went and we had the pictures of the Jesuit priests that had been slaughtered by U.S. troops, U.S. trained troops in Central America. And uh, he, he avoided our group. He knew that we were sitting there. He knew me because he'd met with me a few times. But uh, I finally stood up, and you know, and uh, he was very, very uncomfortable. But I could not be silent in the, in the you know. You keep well, walking. Yeah. But I still have deep resentment against George Mitchell and what he said. You know, to say that if the U.S. left there, the people would eat each other up. That sounds like something Trump would say. Are they cannibals? Would they eat each other up? What is he saying about these beautiful people? You know, I was outraged. I've never forgiven him for that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know he's done some good things, you know, in Ireland and elsewhere. But to speak of people in such a horrible tone, you know, I mean, he grew up in Maine, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> um, and then I went to uh, El Salvador in 2010 for the 30th anniversary of the assassination of Archbishop Romero. I went, I went with Ray Bourgeois, a priest who uh, organized the School of the Americas in Columbus, Georgia. Right. Now, the School of the Americas was a training camp originally in Panama for U.S. Troop, for US troops to train Central American troops or Latin American troops, all right, to go back and slaughter their own people. But then it moved to uh, Columbus, Georgia. And I've been down there a number of times for their um, November vigils, which always takes place at the same time when the Jesuit priests were killed in El Salvador with Roy Bourgeois. And we uh, met with you know, all kinds of people there. One group of people were trying to establish a radio, had a small radio station, and they were threatened with death because they were opposing the uh, Canadian mining companies who were mining for ore and using arsenic in the waters that people were drinking, you know. And we met with those people. And we met with one little community where the uh, community organizer had been brutally tortured and murdered uh, because of his opposition to those mining companies. And we went to the, the university where the brothers had been murdered. We went to the grave of the American sisters who had been raped and murdered by U.S. trained troops. We went to the cathedral and visited the tomb of Archbishop Romero, which was packed with people, packed with people. The, the love that that man, you could f feel his presence. It was so real and the love that he, and the, the tomb was covered with flowers. We went to his funeral mass, and the night before that, they had a big um, gathering in front of the cathedral where I had seen this horrible action on television when the troops had turned on the students who'd gone to the cathedral to protect themselves, you know. And what infuriated me, if you've ever read the story of Romero and how he was, uh, criticized by the other churchmen there is during this ceremony outside where all these bishops and their finery and I wanted to scream, what are you doing here, you hypocrites? Because this beloved man should have been followed. His, his voice was to stop the violence, to tell the troops to not fire on their own people, you know. Uh, it was a very powerful, a very, very powerful experience. We marched in the parade one day, but the sad thing that I felt when we were in El Salvador was the, a lot of hatred still against this man who had worked so hard to bring peace to his, to his country. And if you go there today, you know, you could see it in some churches. Uh, in one church we went to, 
There were these big statues to some of these, um, you know, right wing um, or saints or whatever. And Romero's presence was not observable at all. It was really, really sad. Even in the airport, there was a beautiful photograph of Romero, you know, but you could feel the tension and even the signs along the road, the right wing uh, political signs painted alongside the roadside. So I have to tell this story because. I've seen it. I've walked the steps of those people. And I see these children and these families coming up from Central America and being denied presence here in this country, especially the people of Guatemala. I have, I've got pictures of uh, the School of America's vigil too. How was, how was it with traveling with Roy? Did he set up? He was wonderful. He was, he was absolutely wonderful. You know, we, uh, uh, we stayed in a little hotel, and across the street was a pub, and we used to go over there at nighttime and have a beer, you know. I'm not a beer drinker, I had a wine, but, but it was just a wonderful close group with, with uh, Roy, Roy, Roy Bourgeois, and uh, uh, we, we met with so many wonderful people, you know. I mean, the people of Latin America are so warm, kind, they're so beautiful. And they've suffered so much, you know. Yeah. And we are the, uh, you know, we're the spoiled, rotten, you know. And, and, and to go there and to read every day about these people coming up to the border fleeing violence, I've seen it down there. I saw what was happening. And I saw what our government and other people have written about it. What was the role of the United States in Central America that causes the, the violence down there still, you know? Some of the young people fled Central America during that time and went to California and they got into drugs and they got into gangs and those are the ones now who've gone back. You know, <coughs> Nicaragua was a very peaceful country when we were there. There were no drugs or anything like that for a long time and now, you know, those countries are all, you know, disasters. Uh, another thing I, I, Joe Brennan, when he was governor, he was, uh, Reagan wanted to nationalize the, uh, federalize the National Guard. I wrote him a letter and I pleaded with him. I said, please don't allow Reagan to take over the main National Guard because he'll send them down to Honduras to build roads for the Contra. That's exactly what they were going to use them for. And his secretary called me up and she said, Suzanne, I want you to hear the letter that Joe wrote about this, that he was refusing to allow the main National Guard to go to Central America. You know, <laughs> so there was so much going on and so many good things. And Joe Brennan, he's disappeared. I don't know where he is, you know. We met, we, there were other people, as a, a Dr. Charlie goes to today, who was in that group, Dr. Uh, Walter Love and his wife Meg Webb were both part of that Central America group. And uh, we, we stayed together for a long time, but then we kind of drifted on to other issues. I mean, there's so many issues, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I felt, was... Martha, that I was under the belly of the beast. I really did. I felt that, you know, my government was creating the suffering for these people. You know, uh, if you know the story of Roy Bourgeois, he was a Marine. He was in Vietnam, and when he left, he was so appalled by what he had seen and done that he joined the uh, Marinol brothers, became a priest. And uh, he knew of, uh, he read the sermons of uh, Robert, uh, uh, Archbishop Romero. And you know what he did? He, he rented a uniform, a military uniform. He got a boom box and he had a recording of one of Romero's speeches and he climbed a tree at the base there in uh, the School of the Americas in Columbus, Georgia, turned the volume really loud because there were Central American soldiers being trained there to go back and kill their own people. And that's how he got started, <laughs> that, with that small effort. And the first time I went there, I wore a shroud, which I've worn at some of the anti-nuclear, um, you know, um, demonstrate, I wore this white mask and a black shroud. And friends of mine who had gone down but had stayed over got the newspaper the next day and there was my picture on the front page saying, faceless nun. <laughs> 
<laughs> and after that, everybody started wearing these death masks. Mine was not a death mask. I got it in a gift shop. It was supposed to be like a drama face, you know. And it's, it's kind of creepy. Is that the one it's creepy. It's creepy, especially when you put the black shroud with yeah. it, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but since then, people have gone, and lots of them wear the shrouds and the, uh, you know, and the faces, the death mask faces, to try to call attention to... If you've never been to that uh, center, you know, that gathering at the School of the Americas, now they go to the border and they do other things besides just that action in Central America. But at first, um, it was quite open. In fact, one day, one time when we were there, there were a lot of nuns that went to this uh, demonstration. This, and a lot of them wore these little cardboards on their shirtless things, cardboard on a string that said POC. Prisoner of conscience. Some of them had spent months in federal prison for their actions against U.S. policy. Wow. Some of them were in wheelchairs. Some of them were in their 80s when they were arrested and in prison. So at one of these events, a group of nuns wheeled onto the grounds of the base. It had no gates or fences at that time. And they, uh, the uh, speaker came over, a loudspeaker, uh, saying, you will have to leave the property because we do not have uh, uh, handicapped accessible uh, buses, you know. And instead of leaving, the nuns circled their wheelchairs and refused to leave. I, I just, you know, you go to those places and you see the most amazing people <laughs> you've ever seen in your whole life. I have an article here uh, that was written by Jerry Genesio on our meeting with George Mitchell. But I have two articles here. One dated, let me see, it's from the Boston Globe, Friday, February 20th, 1999. Guatemala supported genocide, the UN finds. The government allowed the army to carry out a policy of genocide against Mayan Indians during the bloodiest era of Guatemala's 35-year civil war, a UN commission declared yesterday. As a crowd wept and cheered, the Commission for Historical Clarification presented a report that found the government responsible for 93% of the 42,275 human rights violations that the panel investigated in 18 months of interviews. This is from the New York Times, Friday, February 26, 1999. A Truth Commission report made public today concluded that the United States gave money and training to a Guatemalan military that committed, quote, unquote, acts of genocide against the country's Mayan people during the most brutal armed conflict in Central America's Guatemala 36-year civil war. The report of the Independent Historical Clarification Commission contradicts years of official denials of the torture, kidnapping, and execution of thousands of civilians in a war that the commission estimated killed more than 200,000 people. And we ask ourselves why. Just unbelievable. There was a there was a there was a man who wrote op eds in the Boston Globe frequently during this time. Yeah. He was a professor at BU, and I can't find. I read his articles every week, and he talked about the genocide going on in in uh, Guatemala, and he and his wife adopted two Guatemalan children. And he was a professor. I wish they must have his name in their archives. Yeah. You know. I bet you if you could find that, but he wrote uh, at least once a month he had an op-ed in the Boston Globe about the genocide. People were not paying attention. And as I said, it was so well organized. I've never seen anything so well organized with certain streets for certain parts of the country. You know, New England parked on certain avenues yeah. and others parked on certain streets. And, and uh, uh, I remember uh, walking down, this, down the street, you know, uh, and Fifth Avenue and looking up one street and it was lined with policemen. They had nothing to do because it was such a peaceful gathering. 
So there must have been 200 policemen, yeah. you know, and I've been at yeah, other places where the policemen were right there with barriers, barricades and so forth, especially uh, during the Iraq war, you know. Uh, well, there was one in Washington that we went to and the police were, you know, tapping their uh, batons, you know, in their hand. They were not friendly at all. We went to uh, New York City in one, uh, one of those marches and uh, there were a couple women that hung around with me because they'd never been on one of these, you know, and the streets were lined with barricades. And I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going over a barricade. <laughs> So and I did. I went through the chairs and everything, and they they followed me. And event, later on in the day, we uh, needed to get back to our buses. And I said, "Well, let's take the uh, the L L, you know, the uh, subway or whatever, the elevated, and find our way over." And we stopped in one neighborhood, and we got out to have lunch or something to eat. And it was an Afghan neighborhood. There are all these shops with all these beautiful dresses and jewelry and so forth. <laughs> you know, I mean, I got daring, you know, after I'd been to a few of these things that I, you know, uh, decided that if there was a barricade, I was going to climb over it and there was nobody going <laughs> to And I always said to the policeman, thanks for doing such a great job. <laughs> and we were doing, Tom and Sturgeon and I were heading up this parade in Augusta at the Civic Center. Uh, because uh, there was a big, uh, it was during the campaign and they had all these uh, newscasters there, television crews and so forth. And we had Samantha Smith and her parents and they joined the parade and we in marched. In person? Yeah, in person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Samantha, uh, I taught in Manchester and Samantha was a student there. No, what was she like? <laughs> she was a very sweet, sweet girl and her, her mother was very shy and she lives in Booth Bay. And she's still a very quiet, very, you know, um, shy person. And Samantha was just an adorable, bubbly little girl, just beautiful little girl. Such a tragedy, you know. And they had a wonderful display at the Augusta Museum of all the things she'd brought back from Russia, you know, the costumes she wore and, the, you know, the shoes and so forth. Oh, you know, but there was a lot of resentment about Samantha. I mean, I, I taught in Manchester, and I think there was jealousy or something. I don't know. I don't understand people sometimes, yeah. you know. She had so, there was so much attention on her. Yeah. And of course, it was anti-communism at the time. What was she doing going to Russia, you know, that communist nation? You know, because I, I think when I taught in Manchester, I was the token communist in the building. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> But this little girl writing that letter and then going there and being treated like royalty. And oh, when I was at uh, Georgetown University for that seminar, you know, uh, uh, on uh, lobbying on Capitol Hill. Oh, yes. Um, I was in the dining room one day and uh, there was a group of women speaking a strange language and being nosy. I went up and I said, oh, might I ask what language you speak? And they said, Russian. I said, Russian? They said, yes, we're from Russia. We're studying English here. And I said, do you know Samantha? Did you know Samantha Smith? And they all lit up, you know. They they just, you know, oh, yes, they all, all heard of her or, you know, read about her. So I went back to the table, and there was a woman sitting there, and I said, isn't that exciting? These women are here from Russia. And this woman said, those communists. <laughs> That's the feeling I got at Georgetown University. It was just so right wing. You know, we had that that, parade, that march in, in Augusta up to the Civic Center. And I made some prizes, uh, you know, for those. Uh, I took my zucchinis. I had these huge zucchinis, and, and I uh, fixed them up. I decorated them like missiles. And I said, throw zucchinis, not missiles. Fire the zucchinis, not missiles. <laughs> you know, this was at the time when, you know, I'd That's been nice. driving around with with that cruise missile on the back of my car for a couple of years. Cruise missile on the back of your car. <laughs> I wish I could remember what Bob's last name was. His parents were a good friend of ours, and he was, he was an early member of the uh, Veterans for Peace. And he uh, he was in the platoon with Ollie North. That's why I. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah. And he said Ollie North would jump on a table and scream and urge everybody. You know, he was insane as a as a marine. You know, I mean, he was a real gung ho warrior. Ollie North was. Oh. About the Barricans, you know, when they came to um, 
bath, you know, and uh, protested uh, against the bath ironwork and the making of missiles and so forth. We'd gather over there in one of the churches, and I remember making a bread pudding, a huge bread pudding with maple syrup and all that stuff, and they just devoured the maple, the <laughs> bread pudding, you know. What church? What church? It was the Congregational Church in uh, Bath. It was a big white Congregational Church that eventually emptied because I think it was too liberal for Bath residents and it shrank in size, you know. The other day oh, yeah, and they'd go out on the bridge and pull down these great big banners, you know, on that huge bridge and then wait to be arrested, you know. On the bridge? Well, on the bridge or down by the uh, iron ward, you know, by the... And, and, uh, and during the Vietnam War, I hid one of their cars in my driveway in Augusta. Dan, it was being taken to some place and they, you know, they asked if they could use my driveway. I lived on this dead little dead end street where nobody, that nobody knew existed, you know. And he stayed, Dan stayed at our house one time and gave a rousing sermon in this little Catholic church that I belong to. <laughs> Big booming voice in a very conservative church, but a very progressive priest. It was well attended, yeah, you know, but uh, <laughs> he was a big man. He had a passion. Both of them were passionate about what they were doing. Um, and sp spoke stentorously, you know, had this loud voice and so forth. And uh, there's so many things that went on at that time, you know. I mean, Tom Sturdivant and, and I, and my, I was a single parent at the time. We took this couple to Nova Scotia so they could fly to England and escape being arrested for their actions, you know, during the Vietnam War. Tom was incredible. His funeral, his memorial service was a riot because uh, Tom loved to ice skate and he had this, uh, this little pond that he used to love to skate on and he actually blew up a rock. I thought to myself, that's such a violent act. You wouldn't think of Tom doing such a violent thing as blowing up a rock that was in the middle of the lake, you know. How did he blow up a rock? I don't know. I, he took some dynamite or something, but I remember that uh, he, did that he, he, he did it intentionally <laughs> to get a rock out of the way so that they could skate on this lake. <laughs> so but he was such a gentle, wonderful man. Yeah. I was teaching in Manchester and Tom was teaching at Coney High School. I didn't know Tom at the time, but I would read his letters in the paper, and I'd think, oh my God, he's gonna get in trouble, <laughs> you know, because he was writing against the Vietnam War and so forth. And, and eventually he left Coney High School and worked for a printing company, and I have this print, uh, this uh, saying that Tom had printed out, you know, what, what uh, something to the effect that what was what is the cost of my having all these possessions? What cost was it to humankind? So, in other words, that I should have all these possessions? You know, I have it at home. Why did why did we need Central America for their land? You know, so that we could grow. When I flew over Honduras, you looked down; it was just banana fields, and then you'd see this little one spot and it would be the mansion of the banana plantation, you know. I mean it was all banana, US, the U.S. Uh, fruit company. Yeah. And who owned the fr U.S. fruit company? The Dallas, Dallas Brothers, the Dallas Brothers, yes. And their son, be one of their sons became a Catholic priest, very, very right-wing Catholic priest, you know. <laughs> they were notorious. And this is what they wanted, the land down there so that they could exploit it, you know. And, and this labor. is and this is what we've done everywhere. I just, I, I listened to a program, I was heading to the dermatologist the other day, and it was about guana in the Philippines. Now, Mark Twain wrote this incredible article about the U.S. policy, the U.S. raid, or the U.S. takeover of the Philippines back in 1895 or 1898. And it was not published because his wife was afraid that it, he would was risking his life, that he would be killed for writing this article. So it wasn't published until maybe 20 years ago in the Atlantic Magazine. I've got a copy of it at home. The United States invaded the Philippines and killed, I don't know, thousands, 
maybe hundreds of them, and there maybe have been only 10 casualties in the U.S. troops. It was terrible, and Mark Twain wrote this composition about that. And the other day there was this program and they were talking about the, there was this island in the Philippines that was noted for its guana, where the birds would, it was, a, you know, and it was piles high. And in the Midwest of this country they had already depleted the land from uh, abuse. And they needed that guano to bring the nitrogen to the fields. And that was the beginning. I thought, I wish I could hear that whole program. I missed but I thought, this is something else that we don't know about. How did this all, what did we want in the Philippines, you know? What was it about that territory that we needed to exploit? That long history, Martha. But that's what we need. We did that, you know, um, in Augusta one time. Somebody built this, made this huge globe, and we carried it across the bridge in Augusta. You know, we rolled it on. That was. And don't ask me which cause that was. It was one of the peace, you know. Birthday, maybe. Uh, it was one of these peace events. It wasn't a birthday, no. It was a big, it was a big globe, the, like a balloon, you know. And we just pushed it across the river. Just, uh, do you know Natasha Myers? Yes. Do you know what she's done over the years? <laughs> Oh, during, okay, during the center, during, during the water, during the wars in Central America, Natasha was involved too. And she, the uh, uh, Bowdoin College used to have an art festival on the campus, on the grounds of the campus. So Natasha built a series of tents. There were about seven tents and she built these creatures out of nylon stockings so they were human sized. And the first tent was a voting booth in, in El Salvador. And the candidate was, all the candidates were the same person. Okay. And you move from one booth, one was a torture chamber and so forth and so on. It was just incredible. And the last booth was an American living room with a big television set and a six pack and a big couch and you know, I mean totally oblivious. It was fantastic. I'll never forget it. So her husband, Art, uh, called me up one day, right around that same time. He said, Suzanne, uh, we're going to join the parade in Augusta. He said, I'll pick you up. He had this pickup truck, and he had the bodies in the back of it, in the back <laughs> of the truck. And uh, he, we wore sombreros, and we rode downtown in this truck, and he had this little trigger, and it would ooze red liquid from the, from the bodies in the truck. You know, Central America, you know. And we drove down, and Charlie was working at the bank down there, and there was the bank president and his wife standing right. Everybody knew me. They said, I've ruined Charlie's career at the bank because, <laughs> you know, and we're driving down Water Street in Augusta with this truck with the bodies in the back oozing blood and playing Central America, you know, Latin music. <laughs> Natasha was, Natasha is very imaginative. She's very, you, you know, ask her to think of up, to think up an idea of some kind for a costume or so forth, and she'll have something, you know, created within a day. <laughs> she she can shock. Natasha can shock. <laughs> she does. She can do some incredible things. You know, but that tent, I'll never forget that series of tents at, at uh, Bowdoin College, and then Art picking me up and driving downtown with this truck full of. Central American bodies, oh. <laughs> there was a rally, I think in the spring in Augusta, the Young People's Rally, but I went. There weren't many um, older people there, but what I do is I apologize to these kids, you know, and I do it all the time, almost daily I'll say, you know, I really feel sorry because we've left you this mess and you're going to have to clean it up. And I apologize. That you know, this is what it is today. And we've, but we've all got to work together, all ages. You know, because people my age <laughs> and older uh, are aware that we've really made a mess of this earth, you know. We've all done it. And we keep on doing it every day. There's not a thing, not a day that goes by that I'm not adding to the mess. Someone but I was there, Martha, and it was the kids who spoke.
I was I had no intention to speak. It was the kids thing. And I'm so thrilled to see those kids out there, you know. Unfortunately, do we have time? Do they have time to clean up the mess, you know? What do you see that we can do in Maine? Just keep educated. Be you know, be aware of what's going on and speak out. <laughs> you know, speak up and speak out. 